Well, my son wanted to make sure I turned my mic off when we started speaking Spanish. <laughs> my, my kids lack confidence in my Spanish abilities, though I, I like to boast of my great Spanish skills at home. To be honest, I know no Spanish at all, but sure it's fun to try. Turn with me in your Bibles this morning to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. We're continuing our series through 2 Corinthians, and we are going to be completing chapter 6 into the first verse of chapter 7 this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, we're beginning reading this morning in verse 14. <clears throat> Do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean. And I will welcome you. And I will be a father to you and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Let's pray together. Father, we acknowledge this morning that when it comes to texts of Scripture like this, we have a tendency to back away. This morning I pray that you would give us the grace by your Spirit to lean in, to receive, and to respond to the Spirit of God who seeks to shape us in such a way that our lives are a pure and holy temple so the presence of God can be manifested in us and through us to the world who so desperately needs us, needs you. So Lord, in these moments, I pray for your help. Holy Spirit, help me be clear. I pray for us, myself included. Oh Lord God, help us receive. In Jesus' name, amen. Little more is revealing about a person than where his allegiance lies. One of my favorite kings to read about in 2 Chronicles is King Jehoshaphat. From him we learn that any season of a man's life is defined by his loyalties. Jehoshaphat was a king who brought revival to the land of Judah. He was a great king for the most part. He tore down the idolatrous high places and he sent the Levites out to teach the law of God in all the cities of Judah. Early in his reign, he was faced with war by opposing allied nations. Jehoshaphat was afraid, so he turned to seek the Lord his God. And there we have that famous prayer by Jehoshaphat. Lord, we are powerless and we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. And the Lord responded by saying, do not fear, for the battle is not yours, but God's. So Jehoshaphat, with renewed faith, sent the worshipers out ahead of the army, <laughs> praising the name of God. What an act of faith. And the Bible tells us that when they began singing, God utterly defeated their enemies before they even reached the battle line. Jehoshaphat's victory was the result of his resolve to be allied to no one else but the Lord his God. And yet in his later years, his life took a remarkable turn when Jehoshaphat aligns himself to another man. Jeho Jehoshaphat's allegiance to God faltered, and he made an alliance with Israel's king Ahaziah. And tragically, we are told 
that because Jehoshaphat allied himself to someone who did not give his allegiance to the Lord God, Jehoshaphat forfeited God's blessing and protection and the work of his hands, we're told, was reduced to rubble. What we're going to discover here in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 this morning is that the alliances we make with people reveal the genuineness of our allegiance to God. Like King Jehoshaphat, we cannot expect to experience the blessing of God's faithfulness when we unite ourselves with someone who does not give their allegiance to God. Let me try to just summarize in one statement the big picture of what our text is, is, is teaching today. Because believers are called to uncompromising holiness as the temple of the living God, we must not be yoked or bound to unbelievers, but rather cleanse our lives of all that defiles God's presence. Verse 14 begins with a very direct, principled command. The reason I use the word principled is because there are a lot of applications to this command in verse 14, but it's very clear, very direct. Do not be bound together with unbelievers. Now, before we go any further, let's define a couple things here, shall we? First of all, what does Paul mean by bound? What does that mean? And secondly, who's he referring to here as unbelievers? You're thinking, really, Ty, you're going to define what we're talking about by the term unbeliever. But yes, I am in a moment. You'll understand why. So first of all, the word that we translate as bound here literally means yoked together. Paul is using a farming imagery uh, image from Deuteronomy 22, which says, you shall not plow with an ox and a donkey together. Why? It doesn't work, right? They're unequal in strength, unequal in stature. They can't pull equal weight. One will end up abusing the other, and you're not going to have very straight corn in your field, right? <laughs> the yoke was a piece of wood that was laid over the necks of two animals, and the animals were harnessed to the yoke so they could pull in tandem on a plow or a wagon, the two animals were, were actually bound together by the yoke. It kept them pulling together. Well, just as an ox and a donkey would be unequally yoked, so Paul calls believers to not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Now, now why would they be unequally yoked? Why, why would a believer and an unbeliever not be considered an equal, equal in a yoke? Well, because... A Christian's values and ethics and worldview and allegiance to God are defined by God's Word, whereas an unbeliever's values and ethics and worldview are defined by the secular humanistic values of the world, and there is not a foundational allegiance to God. The unequal yoke between a believer and an unbeliever looks a little bit like this. You can throw that up on the screen. There it is. A believer has a certain orientation in life. His orientation is to walk in the direction of God, fulfilling God's purposes, walking according to God's values, walking in the ways of the Lord as God. The believer is going in the opposite direction of the world. Can you imagine yoking up two animals facing opposite directions? That's the picture we have here this morning. So in what ways might a believer and an unbeliever be yoked or bound together? Well, we're going to try to unpack this a little bit. and It gets a little bit complicated, but just hang in there with me this morning. I'll do the best I can to be clear. This, this command could be applied to a number of areas of life. The most common is, is applied to marriage. A believer could possibly be bound together with an unbeliever in marriage. Or in certain kinds of business partnerships, or formal covenant, covenants, or any kind of relationship of deep mutual identity or loyalty, including things like church membership. Right? I mean, this is the reason why the highest qualification or, in the, pro, or the highest part of the process of church membership here at Trinity is for a person to share their conversion experience. 
to tell us how and why they believe in Jesus Christ. Because an unbeliever, a person who may think of themselves as a Christian but not be truly born again, does not share the ultimate allegiance and values and worldview that we share. What Paul is warning believers of is entering into the kinds of relationships with unbelievers that could forfeit the believer's freedom to exercise their conscience regarding values and ethics and worldview and could potentially lead to compromising their loyalty to God. So here's the principle. I believe this behind this. Here's the principle. Don't create an alliance with an unbeliever that could compromise your allegiance to God. Don't create an alliance with an unbeliever that could compromise your allegiance to God. And don't think for a moment that you are so strong that when push comes to shove, you will not be influenced. Paul is not calling us to disassociate from all believers. That's not what this passage is about. Okay, I want to be clear about that. And that would only... That would not only be impossible, it would make our mission of reaching people for Christ impossible, right? Paul is not suggesting that we should never do business with an unbeliever. That's not what he's saying. This is where I said it gets a little bit tricky sometimes. You've got to use some discernment because some contracts put no potential constraints on our conscience while others might. Okay, so we've got to think through what's the level of relationship that I'm entering into with somebody. For example, contracting someone to plow your snow is much different than joint ownership in a business where decisions require both parties' consent. And, 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 there, and it could lead to some kind of compromise or some kind of struggle or battle on behalf of the Christian because of a difference in values or worldview. So, for example, when you're in a business relationship where you don't have the sole ability to determine what your ethics are going to be, where you're depending on another person to also make decisions about ethics that influence the overall big picture, that can put you in a very difficult position. So what I want you to see this morning is that applying Paul's command requires some level of discernment, particularly in areas of, of business and those kind of things. But I do want to say this morning that there are no exceptions when it comes to marriage. Because when a believer marries an unbeliever, there is no way to avoid either struggle or compromise. Your lives are far too enmeshed. Far too enmeshed. Far too tightly bound together for you to not be impacted by the other person's values and ethics and worldview. And if you marry an individual who does not have an ultimate allegiance to God, you are going to be in a life long struggle. You may come up with a dozen other ways that you think you are compatible, but if you are a true believer and the other person is truly not a follower of Christ, then you are incompatible at the deepest level. And the very act of marriage, by the way, the very act of marriage of a believer to an unbeliever is a compromise of your allegiance to Christ. I mean, you can't even say, well, I'm not going to compromise down the road because taking that very step is a step of compromise. By the way, it's important for me to point out to you that becoming romantically bound to another person begins long before marriage. I've often said to my kids, once you begin to give your heart away, it's really hard to pull it back. It's really hard to take it back. So guard your heart. Guard your heart. Guard your heart. I'm so thankful that we've encouraged our, our kids to do this. In fact, even today, my, you know, my oldest daughter Hannah is married to a fine young man, a godly young man. But even in the early days when she's began to be drawn and, and interested in him, we just kept saying, guard your heart, Hannah. Guard your heart. Guard your heart. Guard your heart. Don't run that road. If God's going to do something between the two of you, God will let Ben know. And apparently he did. <laughs> there they go, right? I'm so glad 
You've got to guard your heart. And this, this is important because, as I said, once you give your heart away, it's hard to draw it back again. Paul clearly taught in 1 Corinthians 7 that believers are to marry only in the Lord. This is clear. There's no exceptions. Only in the Lord, that is, to another believer. Now, I do want to stop here and make one point of clarification. It's, it's a side note from this passage, but I think it's important to say because I am bringing some application to marriage that for a couple who may right now be married, where one is a believer and one is an unbeliever, this passage is not uh, an encouragement for you to separate. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul clearly teaches us that the unbeliever is to stay in that marriage if the unbeliever is willing for them to remain. They are to stay there and live faithfully out their covenant in Christ. That's why I said it's it a little complicated because when we, when we get a little bit off of God's original design, we got to start kind of thinking about how to manage life there. And, and Paul addresses that in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. So Paul's command to not be unequally yoked has many applications. In fact, the particular application here in 2 Corinthians 6 has to do with being bound to church leaders who were spiritual imposters. If you remember from last week, Paul had urged the Corinthians in turning from false apostles in Corinth to once again open their hearts wide to Paul and the gospel he preached. And now Paul wants them, excuse me, he warns them from being yoked to those who would have called themselves Christians, yet whose lives and message were contrary to the true gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is precisely why we need to define the term unbeliever. We got an, and I want to interpret it from separate, several angles this morning, okay? There's several ways we, could, we might talk about or describe an unbeliever, depending on the person. First of all, an unbeliever is a person who consciously rejects Christ as Savior and Lord. That's obvious, right? That's pretty obvious. You're not a believer if you come right out and say, I don't believe that. I don't have a place for Him in my life. Okay, But that's not the only way that we see unbelief worked out in someone's heart. An unbeliever is also a person who does not know and love Christ in a personal way as Savior and Lord. They're not walking in relationship to Jesus Christ in a way that they are pursuing a life that is being shaped by God's Word. Thirdly, an unbeliever may, may profess Christ. That's really possible for an unbeliever to profess Christ and even think of themselves as a Christian, but they don't follow Christ as Lord. Here we, we're seeing again the importance of where is a person's allegiance where is a person's obedience? Where is their loyalty? An unbeliever refers to a person who may identify as a Christian culturally, but whose values and loyalties are opposed to Christ. And ultimately, an unbeliever is a person who is not born again. They've not experienced the rebirth by the Spirit of God, and therefore they do not bear the fruit of rebirth in their life. And the bottom line what it means to be a follower of Christ is not just about what we say or what we do. It's about an internal change of life and heart that God brings about where a person turns from their sin to trust in Jesus Christ and the fruit of that is that they no longer live for themselves but for Christ who died and rose again on their behalf. And their life is being shaped. They're walking in a certain direction. I want to say to our young people this morning as you think about relationships and marriage and uh, it's really important for you not just to ask the question is that person a Christian we've stretched that term so far in our culture today that a person may use that term and be nowhere close to what the Bible defines as a Christian as a, as a follower of Christ you need to ask yourself the question is this person walking running in the direction of Jesus do I see the work of the Spirit in their lives? Is God's worst word producing fruit in their life? Now, Ty, why do you belabor the point this morning? Because when you are tempted to enter into an unequally yoked relationship, especially, especially when it comes to romantic relationships, the first thing you will do is try to broaden the term Christian. 
you'll be tempted to do that. But as we see here, in the context of 2 Corinthians chapter 6, a person's profession of Christ can only be substantiated by their obedience and their allegiance to Christ. You know the best way to find out? Ask yourself this question. Is it apparent from their life they are willing to do the hard thing in order to do the right thing in obedience to Jesus? Are they willing to walk the narrow road? Are they willing to do what grains against their flesh and their human inclinations in order to walk in obedience to Jesus Christ? Now, Having defined these two terms, Paul lays out for us three reasons as to why a believer must not be bound or yoked to an unbeliever. Here's the first one. We must not be yoked with unbelievers because our incompatible values and loyalties will result in compromise. Look at verse 14. Do not be bound together with unbelievers for what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness or what fellowship has light with darkness or what harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? For what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, just as God said. Paul asks five rhetorical questions here to highlight the opposite purposes and characteristics of believers and unbelievers. What partnership... What cooperation, what mutual benefit can righteousness and lawlessness attain? They can't. That's the whole point. They're absolute opposites. A believer strives toward the righteous, righteousness of pleasing and obeying God, while the unbeliever strives, still unreconciled to God, to please self. Completely different orientations. Completely different purposes. Completely different allegiances. Completely different. It doesn't mean we won't have some surface things in common, but we have to have our deepest values in common. Or, what fellowship have light and darkness? Well, they don't mix, do they? They, they don't mix. That's why you hang darkening blinds on your window so you can sleep at night. Light and darkness don't mix. In fact, you have to leave the light in order to walk in the darkness. That's the point here. They're, they're, they're opposites. Or what harmony have Christ and Belial? Belial here is a term that refers to Satan. It literally means, the word literally means worthless one. And there are times in the Old Testament when this word is used as an adjective to describe people as well. For example, in the Old Testament, Whenever it's used, it describes rebellious people with rotten character. Every single time. Rebellious people with rotten character. And just as there can be no harmony between Christ, the son of perfect obedience, and Satan, the arch-rebel of God, so a believer and an unbeliever cannot be yoked together in harmony. You can't. You are in opposite kingdoms. They are kingdoms which are hostile, in a sense, to one another. There's no common ground. One belongs to the kingdom of light, the other to the kingdom of darkness. One bows to Jesus as Lord, the other is dominated by the prince of darkness. One selflessly serves God, the other serves self as God. Finally, Paul says, he asks the question, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? Well, idols, as you know, are, are an abomination to the Lord. And to bring an idol into God's temple, which was set apart to be holy unto the Lord, was to desecrate the place of God's presence. And in fact, it was an indication of rejecting God and rejecting God's authority. You can't have both. That's the whole point of these questions. You've got to make a choice. You can't have both. To give allegiance to an idol is to forsake allegiance to God. And to bind yourself in allegiance to an unbeliever is to reject God's supreme authority, according to this text. 
The point of these rhetorical questions is that to choose one is to choose against the other. To choose light, you've got to choose against darkness. To choose darkness, you've got to choose against the light. Now Paul anchors this argument with an incredible truth statement in verse 16. Here it is. For we are the temple of the living God. This is a game changer right here. We are the temple of the living God. Not merely the building, but literally the sanctuary. The Greek word here is naos. You remember in the Old Testament, the temple had several different areas. There was the outer court, the court of the Gentiles. There was the inner court. And then there there was the, the inner court of the inner court, the holy of holies, the holy place, the sanctuary, which was protected by a veil. Nobody was allowed to enter there. Only the high priest once a year after he'd purged himself of sin. And even then, when he went into the most holy place, they tied a rope around his ankle, put bells on the bottom of his garment so they could make sure he was still alive because nobody's going in after him. The holy of holies. There the Ark of the Covenant was, representing the presence of God. And here we're told the believer is the holy place in which the Spirit of God dwells. Take that in for a moment. The presence of God is manifested no longer in the holy of holies in a a building centralized in the temple. No, now it is decentralized. Beloved, the holy place is in our own lives, our own souls as believers And beloved, we are to guard ourselves from sin. We are to guard ourselves from unholy alliances no less than the temple veil restricted sinful man from entering the holy of holies. Much less to set up idols there. You say, well, I'm not setting up idols. I'll I'll ask you to ask this question this morning. Which is worse? An idol of wood or stone that can do nothing really? Paul says there's really nothingness other than we elevate them to a place that's inappropriate and regard them as God when they are not? Or a living person who's living their life not in allegiance to God, but in allegiance to self? Earlier in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul wrote, Do you not know that you are the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you? The temple of God is holy and that is what you are. Now that that should have huge ramifications for how we live and the choices we make. Again in 1 Corinthians 6, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? And that you are not your own, for you've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God with your body. You need to think of yourself as a living, breathing, walking sanctuary. What happens there? Worship. That's what happens there. A manifestation of the presence of God and all that He stands for. Here's the second reason Paul gives us now. We must not be yoked with unbelievers because God's promises are better than the enticements of the world. Paul uses a series of Old Testament quotes to demonstrate the great privilege and the blessing and the responsibility we have as living temples inhabited by God's presence. The first quote in verse 16 comes from Leviticus 26. Where the Lord says, I will make my dwelling among you and my soul will not reject you. I will also walk among you and be your God and you shall be my people. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt so that you would not be their slaves. Listen to this. And I broke the bars of your yoke. I broke the bars of your yoke. The living God Himself says He will reside among them. What what safety, what assurance, what protection, what confidence. God broke their yoke of slavery with those who served idols. Do you hear what Paul is saying? I broke your yoke of slavery, so don't go back into a yoke with those who serve idols. Don't go back into a yoke with those who do not give their allegiance to the Lord God of heaven. 
Israel had God's presence among them in the tabernacle. But listen, we have the presence of the Spirit in our hearts. Go back to chapter 3 of 2 Corinthians. You remember that? Paul was making the whole argument of the glory that we participate in because of the Spirit's work in our lives. No enticement of earth could surpass the life-giving presence of God intimately residing in us. And there's a sense here in which God is calling us, well, in Leviticus 26, God is calling His people to treat His sanctuary with reverence. And for the New Testament believer, that means recognizing I need to treat my own body and my own life with a sense of reverence because it is the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's a place that's to be appropriate for the worship of God. In Ezekiel 37, which, where, where Ezekiel uses the same language, it says, The nations will know that I am the Lord who sanctified Israel when my sanctuary, when my presence was in their midst. And I draw this out this morning, especially for our Puerto Rico team today, because God's presence is manifested where there is purity. And as we read Leviticus 26 and Ezekiel 36, we come to the conclusion that a pure life is essential not only for worship, but also for witness. So our witness does not begin with what we say. It begins with the character of the person that God is shaping us into as we turn from sin and we turn to the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Okay, verse 17. Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you. This is a quote from Isaiah 52, 11. Israel is delivered from the captivity of Babylon. Isaiah says, literally in, in, in Isaiah 52, he says, Depart, depart, go out from there. Touch nothing unclean. Go out of the midst of her. Purify yourselves, you who carry the vessels of the Lord. Okay, what's going on here? Well, when Israel was carried into exile in Babylon, the Babylonians grabbed all the good stuff out of the temple. The gold utensils, all the stuff that was set apart for holy use in the temple, they took that stuff with them uh, to the land of Babylon. And God is telling them, now I'm going to send you back. You're going to take back the things that belong in the temple. And when you go back, those of you who carry those holy utensils, don't touch anything else. Don't touch anything else. <laughs> Reminds me of a couple weeks ago when we were on our way to Kentucky. I walked, we were stopped at a rest area and I was in the bathroom and I... <laughs> I could overhear this guy talking to a little kid, and, and uh, I don't know if it was a son or a grandson, because I, I couldn't see them, but uh, I think I heard that guy say 13 times, don't touch that! Don't touch anything! No, get your hands off there! Stop touching that! We gotta get out of here! You know, like, like, the guy was just obsessed. Apparently the kid wanted to touch everything in sight, and I, I guess if my kid was doing that in a, in a men's restroom, I don't know about the ladies, but in the men's, I would have probably the same reaction. And that's kind of the, the picture here. Don't touch that stuff. Keep yourself clean. The image here is like a surgeon who has just scrubbed for surgery. Right? He walks out like this. Don't touch anything. Stay away from me. Don't get close to me. I don't want to get contaminated. Right? This is a picture of what our lives are to be. Set apart as holy unto the Lord. Scrubbed for surgery. Uncontaminated by sin. Set apart. What, is it, what, is, what does Paul mean when he says, come out, be separate? He means be distinct. Be distinct. Don't be like them. Don't love what they love. Don't seek what they seek. Don't touch what they touch. Don't be defiled by what they are defiled. Be distinct in this world, from this world, by your purity. By the way, this is Isaiah 52. You know, Isaiah 52 ends? It ends by speaking of God's servant, God's servant who would bring a true cleansing to all the nations. And guess what's next? Isaiah 53, the suffering servant of Isaiah 53 who bore our sin. He provides the cleansing. Now, it's not a surprise that Paul would next quote Ezekiel 20, 34, and this is out of the... Greek version of the Old Testament where he says, and I will welcome you. 
What's interesting about Ezekiel 20, this quote, is that it serves, in the context of Ezekiel 20, it serves as both a promise and a warning at the same time. It's a promise and a warning. God is saying, I will bring all of you out of captivity, but not all of you are going to go back into the land. Why? Because God says He's going to purge the people on the way out. He's going to purge the rebellious from among them. In other words, there's great hope for those who purify themselves, but there are great consequences for those who don't purify themselves. That's the point. Finally, Paul quotes 2 Samuel 7.14 here. Listen to these words. I will be a father to you, and you shall be a sons and daughters to me. Notice the intimate language here. No longer just, I will be a king and you will be my people. I will be your God and you'll be my people. No, I will be a father to you. You shall be sons and daughters to me. Notice the intimate language of adoption here. The context of 2 Samuel 7 is, is God's covenant to David in which He promised to faithfully bring the rod of correction when David sinned. David, I love you! And I promise my faithfulness to you so that when you sin, I will not leave you there. I will bring the rod of correction and I will turn you back. That's a loving father, right? Beloved, a father not only loves and provides, but out of love provides discipline for his children. Now don't miss the last phrase of verse 18. After all these quotes, after all these promises, Paul says, says the Lord Almighty. Notice that he began this section in, at the end of verse 16 by saying, just as God said. Now he ends by saying, says the Lord Almighty. Paul doesn't say. Ty doesn't say. The church fathers don't say. God says. God the Almighty. God is more than able to deliver on these promises of blessing. And He is more than able to deliver on His promise of judgment to those who rebel against His holiness. Now don't miss the forest for the trees here. Don't miss it. Each of these quotations reinforce both in warning and in promise the call to give soul undivided allegiance to God and His people. Every single one. And every one of these quotes has to do with pure-hearted worship. Okay, so what's the relationship between undivided allegiance and pure-hearted worship? <laughs> They're exactly one and the same. You realize in the Old Testament, the Old Testament writers continuously use the word worship interchangeably with the word serve, which carries a connotation of obedience. Right? So, you shall serve, worship the Lord your God and serve Him only. Right? These words are used interchangeably a lot in the Old Testament. And the sense is that a life of worship, a true worshiper, is one who serves the Lord with a life of obedience. And that's what Paul is focusing on here. He's saying, don't, don't allow your life to be polluted again. Don't go back to the old yoke of slavery. Don't go back to the old yoke of idolatry. Walk in singular allegiance to the Lord your God. And as we see example after example after example in the Old Testament of the kings, that means not entering into a yoked relationship with somebody who does not give the Lord their ultimate allegiance. All of life is about worship. Either God or something else. Idol worship leads to ruin. Pure-hearted worship results in God's presence, embrace, and fatherly care. And what we need to see here in these quotes is that the promises of God are better. I will be your God. You shall be my people. I will dwell in you. I will walk among you. The Almighty I will welcome you. I will be a father to you. You shall be my son. You shall be my daughter. The promises of God are better. So don't be yoked to anyone who is not yoked to Him. 
Okay, here's the third one. It's going to be shorter, I promise. We must not be yoked with unbelievers because our goal Our goal, our aim, our destination, our direction, our purpose as a Christian is to blossom holiness in the fear of the Lord. Chapter 7, verse 1. Therefore, having these promises, on the basis of these promises, both a blessing and judgment, on the basis of these promises, beloved, I didn't say that. The text says that. Beloved. You are called God's beloved. Beloved. You are loved by the Lord. Beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord. Paul concludes now with a positive vision of purity for our lives. Okay, he just said, don't be yoked to unbelievers. Calls us to a life of purity, cleansing ourselves. And now he calls us to a life pursuit of purity. We cleanse ourselves because our purpose is to reach the intended goal of practical holiness in our lives. Now, some of you are struggling over the word perfection. I did too. So I had to do a little word study this week. And the word that we translate perfection here, if you're reading the ESV, they use a different word. I can't remember what it is, but they use a different word. But if you, if you see the word perfection here, perfecting, it is not perfection in the way that we typically use the word of like flawless or perfect, <laughs> right? The idea here is a sense of uh, 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 not, not the sense of no longer struggling with sin, but reaching the destination God has given us of pure purity in our daily living. So, It means reaching the intended goal, reaching the intended purpose. For example, a flower has an intended purpose, and that is to blossom, right? Praise God, my phlox is just blossoming like crazy right now, right? Now, it doesn't mean that the blossom is perfect. The blossom might have some blemishes. The blossom might might have lost a petal, but it has reached its intended purpose of beauty, of creating that blossom. So just as the intended desire, destination, the goal of the flower is to blossom, so so we are to blossom holiness in our lives. How? How do we do that? By walking in the fear of the Lord, verse 1 says, by walking in the fear of the Lord, which means fleeing idolatry and pursuing God's presence. Holiness, which is undivided allegiance to God, that's what it really is. We think of purity, and that's true. That's what it is, purity too. But how do you get to purity? You walk in purity by saying, I will do what pleases the Lord. I will not do what displeases the Lord. God has my allegiance. And that leads to a pure life. And so holiness, this undivided allegiance to God, is the positive aim and purpose of our life. And Paul says, live out your purpose! Live for why you were created. Live for why you were redeemed. Live for the very reason that I broke the yoke of slavery and idolatry in your life. Go hard after the Lord your God who Himself is pure and righteous and without shifting shadow. As we prepare for the Lord's table this morning, it's essential for us to ask two questions. Number one, am I pursuing a binding relationship that's opposed to my allegiance to Christ? That's a pretty pointed application of this text. You can't get away from that one, right? If you give your allegiance to one who is not yoked to Jesus, you shun Jesus and His blessing. That's the bottom line. You cannot be allied to both light and darkness. So in the words of Joshua, choose you this day whom you will serve. Know that you are making a choice. Know that not making a clear, distinctive choice is making a choice. Secondly, what sin pollution does your life need to be purified 
of. Verse 1 says, let us cleanse ourselves of all defilement of flesh and spirit, hands and heart, actions and attitude. <clears throat> let me read a few words from 1 Corinthians 11. I'm going to pause and allow you to have some time of reflection before the Lord this morning. Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick in a number sleep. That is, they have received God's discipline. But if we judge ourselves rightly, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord in order that we may not be condemned along with the world. Israel went into Babylon in captivity because of their sin, because of their rebellion against God. Beloved, the good news is God brought them out. And the good news for us today is that Isaiah 53 is for us. We have a suffering servant who laid down his life so we could walk in a pure-hearted allegiance to the Lord our God. And so this morning as we come to the Lord's table, I invite you to prepare your heart to reflect, to pray, to confess, turn to repent some of you may need to break off a relationship today some of you may need to break off a relationship not with a person but with an activity or a pursuit in your life that you know wars against the lord and his purposes in your life let's pray together <clears throat> Holy Spirit, I pray this morning that you would minister with tenderness, and mercy, and grace among us this morning. I pray that your influence would be firm and strong as you guide us away from sin, as you guide us to the sacrifice of Jesus. so graciously and generously poured out for us. Show us our sin. Show us our rebellion. And show us the mercy of God which is greater. And today, Lord, I plead with you, give us the grace to turn to your faithfulness and toward your promises which are better than the sin that entices us. Lord, don't leave us in our sin. Pull us out by your strong hand and by your tender mercy. I invite you to take your communion elements this morning.